Chapter 5 marks the start of the probability portion of AP Statistics, and probability is really, really important. We're going to get second semester into all the really big topics that talk about how you would run analysis on data, things like confidence intervals and being able to run a significance test. Before we can get to those really important concepts, though, we have to have a good understanding of probability. Probability kind of grounds us and lets us figure out like how likely something is um, so we can decide if results results we get are statistically significant or not. Chapter five is our first of two kind of heavy probability chapters. In this chapter, we're going to focus on a lot of stuff that you would have probably seen before with me in Algebra 2. So we're getting the basics of probability rules down in our units. And to kick things off here, we're looking at a little bit of a um, just scenario here. So you and three other friends, there are four of you all together, go and you're studying for a statistics test. So you guys are going to go study together. Um, and then while you're studying, you all have your own textbook with you, but nobody put their name in their book like they were supposed to. And the books all get mixed up while you guys are studying. So everybody just kind of grabs one, takes it home with them, because what difference does it really make? And at the end of the year, when you all go to turn your textbooks back in, it turns out that nobody actually grabbed the correct textbook. So the problem we're analyzing right here is what is the probability that out of four of you, none of you would have taken your actual book back by just randomly grabbing one? So when you enter a situation where you have a probability and you're not really sure how to calculate it, because we haven't done that much with probability yet, think back to the very first day of school when we did that simulation with the airline pilots. Um, that right there is an idea that's going to carry us through a lot of statistics. When you don't know how to find a probability, you do what we did on the first day of school and you design a simulation to try to mimic the problem and you find the probability that way. So right now, I haven't taught you any probability tools yet that we can use. We're going to turn to a simulation to help us out. Next lesson, we're going to talk about designing the simulation ourselves. But for now, we're just going to use a nice little computer applet here to illustrate a few points. So um, in my problem, we had a very lighthearted, oh, lost your textbook. The problem here is a little bit darker in that there's a hospital and there was a mix up with babies and there are four babies that are all trying to get back to their actual house. So if you look right here, I'm going to run a trial. There goes the stork to the hospital. And here come the babies. And you can see like the blue one went to the right house. There's a little sun right there. But then the other three did not end up where they were supposed to. So there are rain clouds instead. Again, a little bit darker than just missing a textbook. But let's pretend this is just like a textbook right here. We want to know what the probability is that nobody matches. There are four kind of people in this problem. None of them are supposed to match. That's what we're trying to figure out. So one trial right there, like we had a match, but that's not nearly enough data to figure out what's going on. But before we get to the specifics of that, I want to show you guys what I'm tracking in my graph down over here, this picture on the right. This is going to estimate for us what the probability is of getting no matches. And we did one trial and we got a match. So right now, after one trial, it thinks the probability of no matches, is it's impossible to get no matches, which obviously isn't right, but we don't have enough data yet. So I'll run another trial. And there it goes again. There go the babies. They're not, we're going to have a couple matches here. We had one match again. So it still thinks that it's impossible to have no matches. And we just keep going and repeating the process here. I'm going to keep going until I get no matches, which I think just happens. Yeah, they all missed on that one. So that was the third trial. And one out of those three had no matches. So now it thinks the probability of no matches is a third or 33%. So we had a dot at zero, a dot at zero. Now we have a dot at 33. And I'll do one or two more just to give you guys an idea here. You can see what's going on. We had some matches there. So now one out of four trials has had no matches. Um, and that's a 25%. I'm choosing to analyze the probability of no matches. I could have easily done one or two or three. It just depends on what you are interested in in the problem. I'll do one more. And then I will kind of bump up the trials here. Um, and again, we had matches. So one out of five times if we had no matches. So right now, after five trials, I would estimate the probability of no matches to be about 20%. But naturally, we learned that having just a little bit of data is not good enough. So what I did right there is I quickly did 10 more trials, turning off the animation. And you can see how the probability after that first match was 33%. Then it went down to like 20%. Now I'm back up a little bit, so it must have happened again where there were no matches. 
et cetera. I'll run another 10 trials. And what I want you guys to kind of observe right now from this graph is the probability is kind of spiky. It's like up, down, over. It can't really decide where it wants to go just yet. After this is like 30 something trials, it says it's around a 37%. If I do another 10 trials, now I'm up to a 42%, et cetera. If you do small amounts of trials, it takes a little while and the probability we're trying to estimate fluctuates quite a bit. Now I'm going to start doing these like a hundred at a time. And again, still got some spikes as we're collecting more data right here. And it's going to keep on going. We were at like 44 or 45% over there. Now we're down to 40%. And I'm going to throw in a thousand trials now. And it's going to keep on going. We were in the 40s for a while. It looks like we're getting into the 30s right here, 38. And I'm up to like 3,000 trials. And what I want you guys to look at at this graph, at the beginning, you saw it was all over the place. Oh, it's 33%. No, it's 20%. No, it's 45%. And there was a lot of that going on. But as we keep going with the number of trials, notice that the graph for this probability right here is getting a lot flatter and a lot more consistent. You can look at that number as it goes right there. It's not really changing a bunch like it used to. And what's going to end up happening if you do enough trials and you repeat the process enough times, you end up leveling out at what the actual probability is supposed to be. Okay. So judging by doing like seven or 8,000 trials right here, I would say the probability of no matches is around 37 or 38% just by looking at all these trials. You have to do enough trials that it levels out. If you do just a couple, there's a lot of fluctuation. We can't trust it just yet. How many trials is enough is a question that we're not going to answer right now, but just do lots. And you can kind of see that it does level out around 37%. 0.5% or so. Okay, so that is the kind of big idea I want you guys to have in your head as we're talking about these right here. So it appears the probability is either 37 or 38 percent in that range. So let's introduce some kind of basic vocab that you guys are probably pretty used to already. Probability you guys all know is the likelihood of an event occurring. Um, and how is probability measured? Most of the time, the vast majority of the time in AP stats, we want a decimal between zero and one. So usually if we have like a 38%, like in the last problem, we're always gonna wanna turn that into a 0.38. Treat your probability as a decimal so you can actually do math on it. A probability of zero would mean something is impossible. Um, or can never happen. Probability of one mean, means it will definitely happen. For example, if I pick one of you guys out of my class, the probability that you are a student at MRH is 100%, assuming I'm doing this in my classroom, um, et cetera. You guys should know very basic stuff about probability, I would think, already. This last problem right here is giving us a probability. It says, oh, the probability of getting a sum of seven when rolling two dice is apparently one sixth. Later on in this chapter, we'll learn how to find probabilities like this ourselves. But for now, it just gives us a probability. And we are being asked, it says over here, to interpret this value. When you interpret a probability in AP statistics, it is important that you talk about it being over many trials or over the long run. You need to make sure you mention this concept of many trials when you give an interpretation of a probability. Kids forget it all the time. I'm gonna do it on your next quiz and ask you to interpret a probability. If you don't mention that there were many trials, you will lose credit on it. So what I would say for this, we're getting a sum of seven when rolling two dice over many sets of two dice rolls approximately one sixth, or if you wanted to do a decimal 0.166 ish of the rolls will have a sum of seven. If you do it many times, about a sixth of them will have that sum that we were looking for in the problem. So when you interpret a probability, always put it in terms of like long run over many trials. 
One other comment on this, it's a bad mistake that kids sometimes make when you look at probability. If you do probability that's kind of small, which happens, especially second semester, we'll find some small probabilities. Let's say your calculator goes like this. That's kind of hard to see. 2.381 e negative six or something. People will be like, oh, the probability is 2.3. Probability is always between zero and one. That doesn't make any sense. If you see something like this, you have to remember scientific notation. You would move your decimal six spots over from there. So you're gonna end up having five zeros in front of that decimal. So be careful, don't ever report a probability that's over one. If you do that, it's like automatically just wrong. You can't get any credit for it. So yeah, the basics of probability here, are not too bad. We have a distinction, which I've talked to you guys about in Algebra 2 a little bit, between theoretical and experimental probability. Theoretical probability is what the formula says it should be. So what the mathematical calculations or formula determine the probability should equal. Um, example of that, the theoretical probability of flipping a coin and having, having it land on heads is a half. The probability of rolling a die one through six and having it land on one is one out of six. That's just using common sense or math. And you can get more difficult or complicated as well where you start multiplying or adding probabilities. But if you did like math to get your answer and you ran a formula of some sort, that's a theoretical probability. It's what it should be in theory. But then we have what's called experimental probability, which is probability calculated or estimated, estimated or calculated by using a large number of trials. Okay, so if you're actually collecting data yourself, for something that's not so easy to do, um, you would be finding an experimental probability. So if I wanted to flip a coin and count the number of heads out of 100 flips, I get 53. My experimental probability of getting heads on a coin could be 53 out of 100. It does not have to match up with the theoretical probability. But if you do lots and lots and lots of trials, it should level out at that value. Okay. The law of large numbers is basically repeating what I just said right there. And it's talking about um, what we saw in that little applet, which is that if many trials are conducted, the probability of an event will level out at its true probability, at its true theoretical probability. So basically law of large numbers says if you do lots of trials, the probability that you get from your data is going to be like it'll level out and be the probability that you were looking for. Okay, so those little spikes that we saw at the beginning will kind of go away and it'll just flat flatten into the probability it's supposed to be. So yeah, um, two more things to kind of close out this lesson here, both relatively short. Um, I'm not gonna make you actually write these down right here, but I've read about like a professor who actually does this in his one of his college level statistics classes. Their homework for the night is to go home and flip 50 coins or just lie about it and write down 50 results. And then he'll kind of walk around the room and decide, oh yeah, you made it up or you actually did it key things that people will do. Um, first of all, if you look at all 50 of these trials right here, people probably won't have too many streaks of more than like three or four in a row of the same thing, where like if you're flipping a coin, it's very possible you could get five or six of the same thing, eight or nine of the same thing in a row. People miss in their head, they misunderstand, and they feel like things need to level out or balance out faster than they actually do. So most people, when they do this right here, when you look at all 50 of these, there's probably about the same number of heads and tails, probably 25 to 25 or 27 to 23, pretty close to each other. Not too many people would go like 35 to 15 or something like that. 
But as we saw in that thing with the babies in the hospital, it took a couple hundred trials before it really did kind of level out where it was supposed to. So it's very well possible that you would have a big streak of the same thing or that you would have more of one than the other when you do such a small number of trials like 50. So that's the main thing that that slide is getting across. And the last part of this lesson is just two misconceptions that are kind of opposites of each other just to watch out for. The hot hand is basically um, assuming that you're basically like on a hot streak with probability. So if I'm flipping coins and I get like five that are heads in a row, somebody would look at that and be like, oh my gosh, you're on a streak. You're just getting all these heads. The next coin I'm going to bet is heads as well. So they think that you're hot. So you're going to keep doing the same thing that you've been doing. The law of averages is like the opposite of that, where if somebody looks at you and you're flipping coins and you flip like six heads in a row or something like that, oh, it's been a lot for H. This next one's going to be tails because it's going to even out. Both of these are misconceptions. It takes lots of trials for things to actually even out. And you can get things that look somewhat fluky in the short term. You can't make predictions in the short term about the very next one. What you want to do if you're going to be accurate is you're going to make predictions about the overall. Um, two quick things to mention right here. One in casinos, um, like there's like the roulette wheel that you can spin and bet on like what it's going to land on and stuff like that. They'll put like a little scoreboard on the side where it'll show what the last roll was that just happened. And people will look at that and be like, oh gosh, it was red. So we must be getting black for this next one. Or, oh, it was an even number. So we must be getting an odd number. That thing that they have up there on the side has nothing nothing whatsoever to do with what's going to happen next because one trial has no impact on the next one. But people like to kind of read into it and picture like it matters when it actually doesn't. Also, industries like um, insurance is a big one. So I'm going to use just auto insurance as an example. Your rates for auto insurance as a teenager are going to be more expensive than your parents or than like a, someone who's like in their 50s or 60s would have because statistically you're more likely to be in an accident. And what companies like that will do is they'll look at the long term of like, OK, how many people, if I insure a million people, how many of them are probably going to have an accident over the course of a year? And they adjust their rates to make sure that they're always making money in situations like that. Casinos do the same thing okay, how many people are going to win if I have 5 million people come in this month? And then, or month, year, whatever. Yeah, if I have this many people coming in and they set their rates that they end up making money. So if you have the ability to have large amounts of trials, you can get a pretty good sense of what's going to happen if you use probability. 